Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This is the exact word said by Julius Robert Oppenheimer, the father of nuclear bomb. Why he said that? If we want to know this, first we have to know about who is Robert Oppenheimer and what he did to this world. Hello everyone. Welcome back to our channel, Hidden Rees. Coming July 21st. Based on his biography, Christopher Nolan directed movie Oppenheimer will release in theaters. Before that, you will know about Oppenheimer through this video. J. Robert Oppenheimer was born in New York on April 22, 1904. His father, Julius was a wealthiest textile importer. And his mother, Ella, was a painter. He had one younger brother named Frank, to whom Oppenheimer would remain close all his life. Growing up, Oppenheimer lived in a swanky apartment on New York's Upper West Side, enjoying all the benefits of a life of privilege. From the start, Robert seemed destined for science. When young Robert was five years old, the Oppenheimer family went on a trip to Germany to visit their remaining relatives there. Robert's grandfather gave him a collection of minerals, and Robert was immediately entranced he became a devoted rock collector. As soon as he got home, he began taking trips into the countryside, searching for new specimens. At the age of 11, Robert joined the New York Mineralogical Club, and one year later, he made his scientific debut there, presenting his first scientific paper. Hoping to give him the best education possible, Robert's parents sent him to the famous New York School for Ethical Culture. By the time he graduated, Robert could speak five languages and had gained a lifelong passion for art, literature, and philosophy. Oppenheimer was a good student earning as in almost all his classes but socially, he was not quite as successful. His friends thought of him as arrogant, excessively proper, and unpleasantly distant, and for the most part, stayed away. Oppenheimer did make a couple close friends. To one of them, his high school English teacher, he once confessed, I'm the loneliest man in the world. Arrogant, ambitious, and alone, Robert graduated from high school and left New York to embark on a new challenge, Harvard University, to begin his scientific career. Robert hesitated when it came time to choose a major. Wavering between mineralogy and chemistry, and finally he chose chemistry. Because of he joined late to the university, he met with severe workload from different professor, it makes him undergo severe depression. Even he tried to kill one of his tutor. Then, in his junior year, Robert discovered physics. And everything changed. Studying under the famous experimentalist Percy Bridgman, Robert immediately fell in love with the field. This, he decided, what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. Robert was able to graduate from Harvard in three years, and in 1926 he headed for England, in the hopes of pursuing a graduate degree in physics. Robert applied for a position in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University, one of the best nuclear physics labs in the world. Robert was assigned to work under J.J. Thompson, the renowned British physicist who, in 1897, had discovered the electron. Robert had achieved everything he could have hoped for, and he was miserable. Robert quickly realized that experimental physics was not his calling. He was frustrated by his work, and his inabilities in the lab soon drove him to the verge of mental breakdown. And he chose smoking as the remedy, eventually he became chain smoker, he did not even care about his own diet and sleep. In desperation, Robert went to see a psychiatrist, who diagnosed him with schizophrenia. The disease was believed to be incurable and required lifelong institutionalization. Still, Robert has enormous intelligence, because one time he managed to learn enough Dutch to deliver a lecture in the Netherlands in just eight days. In 1927, at the age of 23, Robert successfully defended his PhD thesis, and was awarded his doctorate from the University of Cambridge. Oppenheimer's interest in quantum physics also began during this time. He was influenced by the groundbreaking work of scientists like Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, and Erwin Schrödinger, who were revolutionizing our understanding of the quantum world. As a theoretical physicist, Oppenheimer delved into the complexities of quantum mechanics, exploring the behavior of particles at the atomic and subatomic levels. He studied topics such as wave-particle duality, the uncertainty principle, and quantum entanglement. 
His scientific papers were sometimes known to be highly complex and challenging to comprehend for his fellow scientists. His deep understanding of theoretical physics, and intricate mathematical formulations often led to his work being considered on a level that surpassed the understanding of many of his peers. In 1929, Robert became a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Oppenheimer, or Oppie, as he was now called by all who knew him well, got off to an inauspicious start. For his first few years as a professor, Oppenheimer couldn't come up with anything that did the job. He was, quite simply, a bad teacher. This didn't last for long. Oppenheimer became generous and engaged mentor to his flock of admirers. Discussions in class were often continued at his house, over dinner often physics was left behind, as Oppie and his students drank, danced, and talked about art and literature late into the night. At the beginning of his time at Berkeley, Oppenheimer embodied the ivory tower intellectual, and, caring nothing for politics or current events, he isolated himself from both. Immersed in physics and spending all his spare time pondering Hindu mythology or the classics of the ancient world, Oppenheimer had no time to spare for worldly matters. He had no phone, no radio, and never read the newspaper, and, so, was completely unaware of everything going on beyond the bounds of Berkeley. His distaste for European fascism and his distress about the precarious state of the American economy may have shocked Oppenheimer into awareness, but it wasn't until he met a passionate, radical woman, Jean Tatlock, that he was propelled into action. Tatlock was a graduate student at Berkeley, working toward a degree in psychology. She was also a member of the Communist Party. This was not unusual in the 1930s. Tatlock introduced Oppenheimer to the world of radical politics that thrived just below the surface at Berkeley. He joined a number of political organizations, some of which were secretly controlled by the Communist Party although there is no evidence he was ever a member of the party itself. He did, however, have a number of communist friends. He was in love with Jean Tatlock, and he had also befriended Hawkins Chevalier, a professor of French literature and a practicing communist. But Oppenheimer's plunge into radical politics soon proved to be nothing more than a passing fancy. He broke up with Tatlock and met someone new, Kitty Harrison, and this time the relationship would stick. At the time Kitty was married to her third husband, a British doctor. Soon after meeting Oppenheimer, she got a divorce, and the two were married on November 1, 1940. After the birth of his first child, the life of Oppenheimer started changes. World War II In this war, America wants to be an upper hand, so they plan to build a powerful weapon. The U.S. military responded by setting up the top-secret Manhattan Project. In 1941, Ernest Lawrence invited Oppenheimer to a secret meeting of scientists, one of the earliest meetings to discuss how one would go about building a nuclear bomb. The Manhattan Project consisted of a number of labs in secret locations around the country, each charged with solving a different aspect of bomb construction. Leslie Groves had met Oppenheimer shortly after taking control of the Manhattan Project and was deeply impressed by the young physicist. Leslie Groves placed Oppenheimer in charge of the bomb design program. Groves, obsessed with keeping the Manhattan Project a secret, kept the project decentralized in its early phases, and it was his intent that no group of scientists would ever know what another group was doing. But Oppenheimer objected, saying that this type of secrecy would hinder the scientists' work and slow the project. So Groves and Oppenheimer agreed to select an isolated location to which they would bring the country's top physicists, creating a refuge in the middle of nowhere where the scientists could work together and live together. Oppenheimer selected the location himself, Los Alamos. Now it would be his home for the next several years. By February of 1945, the brains at Los Alamos had come up with two designs for the atomic bomb, they were codenamed Little Boy and Fat Man. Little Boy was a uranium-based bomb while Fat Man used plutonium. The scientists were so confident in the design of Little Boy that they deemed it unnecessary to test. But Fat Man did require testing. Oppenheimer and Groves decided to arrange a test, which would be the world's first nuclear explosion. 
They selected an isolated area in the middle of the desert near Alamogordo, New Mexico, called the Jornada del Muerto, or, Journey of Death. The desolate land stretched 60 miles to the north and south and 40 miles to the east and west. This test was code-named, Trinity. And it involved the detonation of a plutonium implosion-type bomb, nicknamed, The Gadget. On Monday, July 16, 1945, 5.29 a.m., the bomb exploded. The flash of light was seen in three states. The mushroom cloud rose 38,000 feet high. The explosion itself created a half-mile-wide crater in the earth, the heat of the bomb fusing the desert sand into glass. Among the physicists, there was applause and cheering, a sense of triumph and relief. The gadget had worked. Oppenheimer was less than enthused. As the bomb exploded, the man perhaps most responsible for its creation instantly thought of a line from the ancient Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that, one way or another. On August 6, 1945, dropped the little boy bomb on the city of Hiroshima, in a single instant, the bomb destroyed 70,000 buildings over 90% of the city's structures. 100,000 people died instantly, or within a couple days of the explosion. At least 100,000 more died within five years. Three days later, on August 9, the United States dropped a second bomb, the Fat Man. This bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki, and it killed another 100,000 people. Following the bombings, he grappled with the moral implications and the enormous loss of life caused by the weapons he helped create. In October 16, 1945, Oppenheimer resigned from his position as director of Los Alamos, intending to return to academic life. After the war, Oppenheimer was appointed chairman of the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission AEC, serving from 1947 to 1952. It was in this role that he voiced strong opposition to the development of the hydrogen bomb. In 1953, at the height of U.S. anti-communist feeling, a Cold War. The Americans, of course, had the nuclear advantage. But all of that changed in September of 1949, when the Soviets set off a nuclear explosion of their own. The Americans were taken off guard, having believed that the Russians were way behind them. The U.S. government suspected that spies must have shared vital information with the Soviets. Oppenheimer came under immediate suspicion, thanks to his former connection with the Communist Party. Oppenheimer was accused of having communist sympathies, and his security clearance was taken away. Louis Strauss, as chairman of the AEC, played a central role in the investigation. Strauss already had conflict with Oppenheimer. The resulting report permanently shut Oppenheimer out of any involvement in government affairs. Same time, Oppenheimer became an influential voice in advocating for nuclear arms control and promoting international cooperation to prevent the further use and proliferation of such weapons. Einstein also raised awareness about the dangers and implications of nuclear weapons. Both Oppenheimer and Einstein were vocal proponents of nuclear disarmament and worked together to advocate for international control and regulation of atomic energy. Father of atomic bomb himself against atomic bomb. A lover of peace, he became the man most responsible for a new era of war. In 1960s, with evidence they proved that, Oppenheimer was not a Soviet spy. In 1963, President Lyndon B. Johnson attempted to redress these injustices by honoring Oppenheimer with the Atomic Energy Commission's prestigious, Enrico Fermi Award. In his later years, Oppenheimer continued to lobby for international control of nuclear weapons and atomic energy. From 1947 to 1966, Oppenheimer also served as director of Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. There, he stimulated discussion and research on quantum and relativistic physics in the School of Natural Sciences. Oppenheimer retired from the institute in 1966 and died of throat cancer on February 18, 1967 at the age of 62. His ashes were scattered into the water on his favorite beach in the U.S. Virgin Islands and it named as, Oppenheimer Beach. Thank you for watching this video. 
Don't forget to subscribe and hit the thumbs up if you like this video. Hidden Rees